Welcome to another episode of Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. I'm Rick, and I'm here with Steve. Howdy. How you doing, Steve? I'm ready to have a good time. Okay, well, let's adventure out somewhere. Where are we going today? Uh, we're going back to Israel. Okay. We're going to a region known in the Bible as Aphek. Cool. Aphek, it's not one of those places most people go to visit, mm -hmm. but it's significant in the Bible. It was the staging ground for many of Israel's enemies. Okay. You know, not just one enemy. We're talking Canaanites, Philistines, and even the Arameans. They all seem to pick that point to launch their attacks against Israel. Okay. So I want to jump into the text, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Okay, sounds great. All right. I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 4. Samuel's word came to all Israel. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before mm. the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh, so that it may go with us, so it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Wow. I'm looking at this going, this is a real graphic, uh, dramatic uh, event that's taking place. And you might ask, well, why would I think it's graphic? Well, obviously, because it's at AFEC. It's a graphic effect. Oh, Rick. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, I'd like to say you can be replaced, <laughs> but really, you can't. You're irreplaceable. Okay. But you can't be muzzled. <laughs> All right, back to the story. Okay. So they go to battle. The Philistines launch from AFEC, and they lose. And some 4,000 of them die, and they're all upset. And they don't remember the covenant, hmm. that they would not be defeated before their enemies hmm. unless they had a relationship problem with God. Ah. So they don't go and say, what did we do wrong? How do we fix it? No, in their very pagan-oriented minds, they go and fetch the Ark of the Covenant as some sort of talisman hmm. to use to help mm -hmm. them defeat the Philistines. Mm -hmm. And you can tell everybody's all thrilled because it says they all shouted and the ground shook. They're so excited. We got God on our side now, we can't lose. As if God and his location are necessary. Well, when the ark wasn't here, he wasn't with us. And now that the ark's here, he is with us. As if God can be contained in a box. And part of that mindset comes to us uh, from the idea of the Canaanites and those that God was a local God. Absolutely. Yes. And I kind of had some of that in my mind, even though the text doesn't say so. I'm sure Aphek was a good staging ground, mm -hmm. but they had to have a reason for choosing that area also. Mm -hmm. Maybe they thought their gods could give them the victory there. Right, right. So Israel's mind was not Torah-centered. It was pagan-centered. Yes. They should know that God says he fills the heavens and the highest of heavens can't mm -hmm. contain him. Mm -hmm that the earth is his footstool. Exactly. They don't need to have the ark there to have God watch mm -hmm. over them. Right. So nevertheless, they're in sin. We know this because they fall. And now we see it in their behavior and their attitude. Mm -hmm. And they figure they're gonna win now. But that's not what happens. God allows the ark of the covenant to be captured, which freaks them all out because they think this is God. This is his holy ark. Mm -hmm. If He's, Somehow if they capture the ark, they've captured God? Exactly. <laughs> okay. And so they're in their silly theology, they're yes. beside themselves. But the Philistines are elated. They just captured the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. They win. Mm -hmm. we, got, we win. You know, you beat the enemy, you take their idols. Right. This is their equival, equival, uh, equivocation? No, equivalence. Their equivalence of Israel's idol. Wow. They captured it. Now they go to present it before their God. Mm -hmm. Funny thing happens. Their God is found next day, face down in front of the ark. <laughs> and I'm sure they looked at each other and said, hmm, that's odd. Did you feel the earthquake? I didn't feel the earthquake. Their God is bowing face to the ground before the ark of the covenant. Mm -hmm. So they take their God, who is no God, who obviously can't stand up by himself, and they prop him up. Next day, he's down again, except for his head and feet. His head and hands are cut off. 
So now they know something freaky's going on. Not to mention they're soon plagued and they want to get rid of this ark. Well, the ark's captured. One of the runners in the battle goes, heads back to where Hophni and Phineas, Phineas's dad, Eli, is. And he says, your two sons are killed. Not only that, he's the head priest. Not only that, but the ark's been captured by the enemy. He can't handle the news. He topples over backwards off the fence he's sitting on, breaks his neck and dies. He's an old heavyweight man. And so now, Hophni and Phinehas, who are leading Israel in sin, what they had been doing is they had been staging themselves outside of the tabernacle and sleeping with some of the women who come in to worship. Mm. They had turned the tabernacle into a place of cult prostitution. Oh my goodness. Oh, they were horrible. And then the offerings that were made to God, they were taking the best part for themselves, the part that was not prescribed to them by the law of Moses. Eli knew they were doing these things mm. and did not stop them. Because of their sins, all three of them, they died on that day. There's a scripture that comes to mind that they had the semblance of religion but denied the power therewith. Uh. They denied the power. They had this outward appearance of being religious, but they weren't following the things that God had, had told them to do. It reminds me of some of the guys I see today. They got big churches, mm. large followings. They're on TV all mm. over the place, mm. and they're always talking about money. Mm. And they're always telling people how wonderful their lives will be if they'll just do two things. One, send them money, and two, believe that their lives will be good. They're not representing God properly at all. No. They think uh, gain is, a, is godliness, mm -hmm. and they're going to be sorely disappointed on that great day. Exactly. They're going to have their fall off the fence. Well, I love how practical these passages are. Well, let's continue. Okay, so they thought the ark was going to protect him. They trusted in the ark. They didn't trust in the God of the ark. We have a very similar situation that happens in regards to the whole temple in the days of Jeremiah, which is well after these times. This is what happened. I'm going to read from Jeremiah chapter 7. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in decept deceptive words and say, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. In other words, hey, God would never allow the temple to be destroyed or harmed. We can live however we want because God's enemies will never breach Jerusalem because the temple's here. And you know it's God's temple. God will protect the temple. Didn't they remember the lesson of Shiloh, of Aphek, of Eli, and Hophni, and Phinehas? And that's what happens in the rest of this text. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, mm -hmm. in the land I gave to your forefathers forever and ever. But look, you're trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury? burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you've not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, we're safe, safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house, which bear, bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? Mm. But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Go now to the place in Shiloh, where I first made my dwelling for my name, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people, Israel. Remember, they took the ark and God allowed the ark to be captured. Right. They thought, oh, the temple will protect us. If God didn't protect the ark, he's not gonna protect the temple. Right. It's not about the place, it's not about the thing. That's right. It's about God and their relationship to yes. him. Yes, and I, I think we even uh, exchange the idea of the body of Messiah or the building that he's doing within the body itself, within believers themselves, and for the building itself. We do. We do the same thing. We drive by and say, there's the church. You know, God is in this place. No, he's in the people in this place. Reminds me of an old story I heard about this busybody woman at a local church, always complaining to the pastor about something. This day, she comes up to the pastor and says, pastor, pastor, the kids are chewing gum in the sanctuary. And the pastor says, Madam, it's the sanctuary is chewing the gum. <laughs> <laughs> 
same idea. Yes, of course. It's not the location. It's the no. people in the location. And their attitude and their relationship with God. And God is basically saying, I did not protect Shiloh, and I did not protect the mm -hmm. ark, and I will not protect this place if you do not get your hearts right with me. Right, right. So has this house, which bears my name, become a, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And while you were doing all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what I did to Shiloh, I will now do to the house that bears my name, the temple you trust in, the place I gave to you and your fathers. So let me just summarize something. Okay because it's leading to even a bigger thing. First of all, the people sinned, so the ark was taken. Hundreds of years later, the people were in sin again. God warned them, they didn't repent, the temple was destroyed. With that in mind, what do you think was going through the typical Jewish person's mind when Yeshua said these words? I'm in Mark 11, verses 15 through 18. On reaching Jerusalem, Yeshua entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Mm -hmm. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Let's talk remez. Okay. What do you think Yeshua was implying in quoting that passage from Jeremiah? You tell me, what, what do you see in this passage, Steve? Well, God warned them in Jeremiah. He said, in Shiloh, I allowed my ark taken mm -hmm. and Shiloh to be undone because of the sin of the people. In Jeremiah, he said, I allow my temple to be destroyed because of the sin of you people. Mm -hmm. Here he is in human flesh, standing in the temple, quoting the same words. And what happened just a few short years exactly. later? Exactly, not one stone left upon another. Exactly, he warned them time and again. And just like it said in Jeremiah, but you would not listen. Mm. The same thing happened when Yeshua was there. The people just would not listen. So what is it going to take for God to remove from our lives? What stone is going to have to be overthrown before we understand as well that we are the temple of the living God? What idol destroyed? What mm -hmm. edifice taken down yes. so that we can listen? Yeah. Mm. Don't go away. We'll be right back. GLC invites you to visit us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash GLC TV. Here you can stay in touch with all of the latest GLC news along with daily scriptural inspirations, current specials in our bookstore, links to our newest shows, and online media plus articles from trusted sources. Feel free to drop us a message or a question by posting to our page. Please help us out and like our page by clicking on the thumbs up button. Don't delay. Drop by the GLC Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash GLC TV. We want to interact with you today. Welcome back to Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. We're glad you're with us. We are talking about some really exciting places. Aphek, Gibeon, Shiloh. And we're okay. still at Aphek. Okay. You know, this, this lesson that um, something that was holy can lose its holiness based on our relationship to God is extremely important. And I'm just trying to think in our lives personally, what changes we need to make in light of the lesson we learned mm -hmm. from Shiloh, Aphek, and the temple. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier how sometimes we look at the church as if it's the holy place, mm -hmm. when in reality it's the people who enter yes. who make it the holy That's place. Right. And if we go in with the wrong heart's attitude, just like Yeshua said, this house, which is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, has become a den of thieves. Mm -hmm. We can take a church or a synagogue and then turn it into some evil place. Yes. A synagogue of Satan. Mm -hmm. to yes, quote exactly. another passage and another lesson if well, our hearts aren't right. One of the things I, I think that we have a tendency of doing, not just this generation, but every generation of, of followers, is 
focusing so much on external things yeah. and not on internal things. You know, when you close your eyes, do you sense that you are a place of holiness for Almighty God who is holy? And I think so we focus on the external things and that leads us into a religious experience with God instead of the internal things that God is doing within us that change the external things to make them then become a reflection of what God is doing. It reminds me of a discussion somebody was having with a, a pastor. What's the proper physical way to pray? Should I be on my knees? Should my face be down? Should I clasp my hand? Should my eyes be open? Should my eyes be closed? And a poem was written. I don't have it in front of me, but basically it's about a guy who fell into a well head first. And he said the best prayer he ever had was ha standing on his head. So <laughs> it's not about the externals, it's about the internals. Yeah, and we, and we also become a den of thieves ourselves when we're stealing the things from God instead of worshiping him and giving back to him the due. And what is the due? And that is the glory, that his honor of who he is, recognizing who he is. And may we never, be that way. Amen. Yes. Amen. So some things have been found at AFEC, some archaeological discoveries. They found an Egyptian fort there, mm. a number of inscriptions from the governor's residence there. Now, this is significant. Remember back in the days of Passover, we fled Egypt. But what most people don't know is the Egyptians weren't localized to Egypt. Mm. They can controlled area all up and down what today we call Israel. So in one sense, we are fleeing from Egypt, through Egypt, to Egypt. Mm -hmm. The fact that they found inscriptions here mm -hmm. means that the Egyptians had control of these areas. So even though Israel left Egypt, Egypt was a continual thorn in their side, yes. a thing to remember, mm -hmm. and a place to fear. Yes. Uh, Herod City, Herod ended up building in this same location some years later. He, he rebuilt it and he named it Antipatris. His father's name was Antipater. Mm -hmm. And so he renamed it after his father, mm -hmm. Antipatris. Um, archaeological work has revealed uh, the city's cardo, which is the main thoroughfare, with shops on each oh, side. Oh, okay. So from Much Egypt, like the Appian Way? Um, the, the main thoroughfare and then the, shops? All and... the thoroughfares were similar. Okay. Now you think about it. Drive through downtown, wherever you are. Yeah. It's the exact same layout. Sure. You've got a street, a sidewalk, mm -hmm. and shops. Yes. And that's exactly how these ancient Roman cities were. Um, Acts 23, 31. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. Mm -hmm. Continuous occupation from the days of the Egyptians up through the days of the Romans. Very significant mm -hmm. location, mm -hmm. and that's why I wanted to talk about it. But we do have a little time left, so I would like to talk about another location called Gibeon. Okay. Um, the Gibeonites were the people that tricked Joshua. Yes. God told the children of Israel, the land I'm sending you to, make no covenants, make no treaties. The people who live in that land, you are to annihilate. Now those people still had a way to live. Okay? They could have surrendered and joined the God of Israel like Rahab did. It wasn't just that she surrendered, she joined the God of Israel. Yes. Now, let's say, well, you don't want to do that. Fine, you can flee. You have the option of staying and fighting, converting, or fleeing. I would think, after watching what God did to the Egyptians, after him knocking the walls down of Jericho, that anybody left with any brains whatsoever would have fled. But they all should win the Darwin Award. <laughs> and that's an award for helping the human race by taking their gene pool out of it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but the Gibeonites were sly. They lived in the area. They didn't want to convert. They didn't want to die. And they didn't want to flee. So what they did is they put on old clothes, took old moldy food, and drove out to meet Joshua. Mm -hmm. And said, oh, we're from a faraway land. Look how worn out our clothes are yes. and how old our food is. Yes. We don't come from around here, but we know about you guys. Give us your word. Let's make a treaty. Now, Joshua was permitted to make a treaty with outsiders, just not people within the land right. of Israel. Right. Because the people who lived in the land of Israel had committed sufficient capital crimes mm -hmm. that God decided to wipe them all out. Mm -hmm. Capital punishment. Mm -hmm. 
These people were amongst them. Mm -hmm. Joshua was deceived. However, Joshua made a mistake. His relationship with God and the priests was such that he could have asked God, what do you want us to do? And God would have told him. But he just assumed that these guys were being honest. He knew, according to the law of Moses, he could make a covenant with outsiders, so he made a covenant. He said, we will not destroy you. Then he found out they were locals. But it didn't go so well for the Gibeonites either, because they ended up becoming indefinite slaves. Hmm. They became the servants of the Israelites perpetually. I guess it's better than dying. Gave them also the ability to learn about God. Mm -hmm. So they found the area of Gibeon. Um, it sits on the west side of a central Benjamin plateau, and they found a bunch of wine cellars there. Um, let me just read to you some of the notes I wrote down. Sure. Impressive among these finds are 63 wine cellars from the 8th to 7th centuries BC. These cellars were bottle shaped, about six feet deep and six feet in diameter at the bottom. It's estimated that 19,000 gallons of wine could have been stored in nine gallon jugs in these cellars. Wow. So I got that off a website that talks about this location. Mm -hmm. But obviously they were a major wine producing city. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is why they didn't want to fight. They were way too jolly from the wine. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> they didn't want to abandon all their wine. Okay. <laughs> There's um, a Bible reference several times to a place called the Pool of Gibeon. Hmm. Uh, at the Pool of Gibeon, David's men and Saul's men met and they battled. And I think it was uh, Abner's son or brother died there and Joab or Joab, I don't know, some, some of the key men fought, killed. It caused a big mess in Israel. Uh, it ended up Joab killed Abner in deceit behind David's back over Abner killing his relative at the pool of Gibeon. Hmm. It's mentioned in the scripture. It's a big story. Israel and Judah make a treaty. Abner leads it. David honors Abner, but jo, Joab holds a grudge. Joad killed Abner. It all happens because of what happened at the Pool of Gibeon. They believe they found the water shaft to the biblical Pool of Gibeon. Wow, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. really neat. So if they're right, and they probably are, mm -hmm. that's the location where that mini battle was held mm -hmm. between Joab's forces and Abner's forces. Mm -hmm. Abner was with Saul, Joab was with David. Mm -hmm. They knew each other. They were intimately acquainted. They were battle buddies from previous campaigns. It was a sad story. But the end result is David mourned for Abner's loss. David put on sackcloth and ashes, commanded all his others to do so, and David fasted for the day. That convinced Israel that he had nothing to do with the death, and that ended up forming the bond between Israel and Judah, and they became one nation after that. Wow, that's incredible. So Gibeon is kind of a significant place. Mm -hmm, exactly. And I think of the water shaft that you're talking about, that reminds me of the water shaft in my mind, thinking of this, that we find at Tel Megiddo, that big area. I mean, it's gigantic, that shaft. Yeah, one of the things we find in some of these sites, um, especially some of the bigger sites like Hatsor, yeah. Megiddo, and Dan, mm -hmm. is similar architectural design. Mm -hmm. We know that Solomon is said to have built up these three places. And since the designs are the same mm -hmm. and they date to the days of Solomon, it's almost certain that we have the remains of the buildings that Solomon commissioned there. Wow, Pretty that cool. is really neat. Yeah. The water shaft, we've got um, the one at uh, Megiddo. Mm -hmm. There's the one at Gibeon. There's another one, uh, I can't remember where it is. Some of these have similar but they're all the Style. same type of design, yeah. which tells us something about Solomon himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And some of these predate Solomon. They go, they go back to the days of uh, previous kings of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, later kings of Israel, mm -hmm. not predate, post-date. Mm -hmm. Yes. All righty. We've got Shiloh to look at, but only a couple of minutes to do so. So let me read a quick passage of scripture. Okay. See what we can find. Joshua 18.1. After they had conquered the land... The entire community of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of the Lord's presence. We had already talked about Shiloh. We know that the tent was there. We saw the ark 
removed from there. We know that Hophni, Phineas died and Eli died there. But Shiloh has some significant remains from the Middle Bronze, Late Bronze, and the Iron Age. What that means for us is the days of the kings of Israel, from before that and during that. Generally speaking, I equate the Iron Age with David forward and the Bronze Age before David. Okay. It may not be exactly accurate, but it's good enough for, for my <laughs> level of expertise. <laughs> for all of us. And so if they've got Bronze Age remains, and Iron Age remains that says they've got remains from the days before Israel mm -hmm. was established as yes. a monarchy and then after. Yes. Um, in the time before the Israelites, the city was strongly fortified with a massive wall and a glacis. The glacis is the um, ramp that leads up to the wall. Okay. The way they fortified their cities in ancient times is they would like dig a big, we'll just call it a moat, but it's okay. a dry moat. And they would heap all that stuff and make an artificial hill. And they would slope it. And then on top of that hill, they would build a wall okay. and their city. Okay. Or at least their fort. So in order to attack it, Jericho was undoubtedly built in that fashion. Mm -hmm. Big ramp. We're talking, you know, 15, 20, 30 feet, whatever it is. And then on top of that, a wall. Yes. And I call it a ramp. It's not a ramp. It's just a steep hill. Very difficult to climb up and fight. Mm -hmm. And if you're standing on top of the wall, you can just throw down stuff, shoot arrows. So they found one from the days before the kings of Israel and Judah were there. After they settled there, they, th they believe it was unfortified. And then the Iron Age residents, after, again, rebuilt the earlier fortifications. Wow. They think they found houses there from the time of Samuel, but we don't have time to talk about them. Okay. <laughs> 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 but we will be talking about more significant things in next week's Rock Shovels and Manuscripts. Hope you join us. God bless. See you then. This episode was produced by and for God's Learning Channel. If you're enjoying this series, your financial support will help us keep this program on the air. Simply send your contribution to God's Learning Channel, P.O. Box 61000, Midland, Texas 79711-1000. Or log on to our website at www.glc.us.com and donate using PayPal. Please be sure to designate which program your contribution is intended to support. Thank you for helping us make unique quality programming a reality. Order your copy of this program from the GLC Bookstore by calling the numbers or visiting the website on your screen. Please include the program number when ordering.